Also, we'll have this call again on Saturday at 4 p.m. Um, I know Wednesday evenings as well, have, they've got Christman. Um, and Simon is an activist and a trade unionist with years and years and years and years and years of activist experience. So he's come to share some of it with us today. Um, from environmental justice to social justice and beyond. He has heaps of, well, of experience to draw on. Um, today, he's going to be speaking about how to shift a narrative using as an, an example of his work on the campaign that made mental health a key election issue in 2017. So over to you, Simon, thanks so much. Thanks, Abby. Well, New Zealand's had one of the world's worst youth suicide rates for decades, yet it took a pair of shoes and a hundred personal stories of people affected by mental health to finally make mental health a key election issue in 2017. But why did a pair of shoes and some personal stories make a difference when hundreds, if not thousands of advocates have been raising awareness about New Zealand's mental health crisis for more than two decades? And this wasn't uh, even the first time that empty shoes had been used for suicide prevention activists. So what was different? The difference was that we had a carefully planned campaign strategy that combined those personal stories and striking images um, to create media momentum that shifted the narrative and became the loudest one during the election. And it was achieved with only a few uh, staff, less than 50 dedicated activists and 300 personal uh, people willing to share their stories. Now I'm gonna, sorry, I'm just gonna share a screen. Just gonna, I'm, I've got two screens. That's why it looks a little bit funny. Just give me a second. That should be, oh, no, one moment. Go. Is that coming through? Thumb up. Thank you. Cool. Sweet. So, I'm just sorry, I'm just switching my computers again. So, I'm going to talk about why those personal stories and striking images wrapped around by strategic political campaign can create and shift narratives to make social change. And so the structure of the session is going to be that I start with a case study around Yes We Care, which is the uh, campaign around suicide prevention. And well, it started off about being about uh, health funding in general, but fo uh, it pivoted to focus on mental health funding. Uh, and it made mental health the key election issue in 2017, like Abby said. And it's going to follow a chronological structure, following the basic structure of how most campaigns are planned and the phases that campaigns go through when we, we're, we're delivering them. And it relies heavily on videos to show what the campaign looked and felt like. Uh, then I'll do some questions and answers. Uh, and then if we've got time, um, if, if you prefer, we can do a more of a chat facilitated workshop where we can dive a bit deeper into personal stories and striking images as a tactic and how to practically um, do it. Uh, as Abby said, um, just this is going to touch on suicide. So, and that's obviously a sensitive issue. Um, in my talks, it's always okay to not be okay. If, if it makes you feel upset and you need time out, that's totally cool. If you want to get in touch with Abby, don't worry about interrupting the talk to send her a message. Um, also, um, no one said that they're visually impaired, but if, if you're finding the imagery too much, just let me know and I can verbalize some of what you're seeing. Don't worry if I don't cover your questions, I can answer them afterwards. And don't be offended if you want to tell me to slow down or include more unicorns in the presentation because this is an ADHD positive space. You're cool. We'll get, we'll jump right into it. Oh, it's a bit of a pain doing two laptops. Okay. So I'm just going to start out by talking about the basic steps of campaign development. So in front of you, you can see four steps, assess, plan, do review. It comes from education and observation of how young people learn and like we're not going to go into a lot of detail around this, but this is sort of the structure of how the, the conversation is going to go. Oh, damn it. Hang on. Sorry. What is going on? Okay. Juggle, juggle. Okay. So just briefly. So yes, we care coalition uh, was a coalition of people working uh, in health services, people who use health services, unions, whānau bred by suicide, and it was funded and led by the PSA. And it started in 2016 and it finished um, at the end of the 2017 election. And I'm just going to start off with a, a little video that sort of explains the background to what, we're, what we were doing. And just give you, do your thumbs down if you can't hear it and thumbs up if you can hear the audio. You should be able to hear it. My name's Nico Woodward. I work as an emergency department nurse 
but I've put my career on hold to better understand the growing crisis in the New Zealand health system. In 2016 alone, the health budget was underfunded by $1.85 billion. That's the equivalent of 20,000 missing health workers. To highlight this chronic shortage, the Yes We Care campaign has created a shadow workforce to stand together for health. We're building up an archive of stories that really highlight what it's like for people using the health service and people who are working in the health service as well. My name's Tia McTeague and I have spondylitis in my back and it gives me intense pain. I can't stand for longer than an hour. There was an operation that I could have, but due to funding, I couldn't go on the waiting list. There's a call for a national survey to identify unmet health needs with a new study suggesting almost 10% of us aren't getting the hospital treatment we need. Many GPs have long given up referring patients who they know won't get seen. Patients in pain who have exhausted all other treatment options. We were one of the first countries on earth to guarantee universal access to hospital treatment. But the government is saying more and more you might have to provide for yourself. As a perioperative nurse I see on a daily basis people coming in for surgery who sometimes have had to wait far too long to it, their health has deteriorated, they may have been in a lot of pain, some people even have had to leave work. There are big studies from Europe showing that if you treat conditions early, the complication rates are low, people who are at work get back to work quicker, people who are, might be retired stay independent longer. My worry is for those people who just can't get in. Mental health services around the country are at crisis point, with a 300% rise in referrals over the last five years. My name's Patrice, and this is my son Brad. He died from suicide. I was very angry because the coroner's report came back that he had received suboptimal care. After Brad died, I wanted to work in the field specialising in the area of suicide. As far as I'm aware, nothing has changed. The system's underfunded. The onus is totally on the government as far as I'm concerned and people have had enough. Our goal is to ensure every Kiwi gets the care they need when they need it. We've got an ambitious plan to make healthcare a key election issue. To do this, we need to build a movement that puts people at the heart of our health system. So join up and share your story at yeswecare.nz. So this is a, a, a video from midway through our campaign, but it sort of introduces the campaign elements and what we're trying to do. So starting with assess, which is the first stage of a campaign plan, um, you know, assessment is the first thing you do before you do the campaign. You identify what the issue is, which is clearly here, health funding. We hadn't yet pivoted to mental health. And, you know, it's... You've got, you need to know the terrain in which you're politically operating. You need to know your enemy, who are the people, the decision makers that are uh, creating obstacles to the vision that we want. And most importantly, we need to know ourselves. So in, in developing this campaign, there were a number of things that we needed to know. And the first thing is the context was politically that National had cut funding by 1.7 billion from public health in real terms since 2009. Uh, we, the majority of the public weren't aware of the, the details of the problem, partly because health workers themselves were working so hard to cover that gap that it was hard to see. We knew that health workers were um, really trusted. Recent strikes by the PSA, which is the Mental Health Union and the Doctors' Union received a lot of support. But it's also difficult to get unions and union members active outside of uh, bargaining. Um, and, um, and this was an election year where there was no bargaining going on except for the nurses union, but their bargaining was so close to the election we didn't think we could we could use that. So whilst we would have preferred that we were taking, you know, as a union taking industrial action and mental health, we knew that was unlikely to happen. So based on our analysis, uh, we, we knew that we needed to have the community on board and we needed to have people using mental health services and health services sharing their story. And in that video, you saw a number of cuts from different stories that we produced during our first roadshow, which was the first stage of the campaign. One of the other things that we analysed was that there were so many voices in the health sector um, speaking from subsectoral issues like kidneys or heart or lungs, that it was really hard to get cut through 
because there wasn't a common fun underfunding narrative behind it. You know, it's more of a sort of squeaky wheel sort of approach that we've had in our health sector where different groups will push for funding for their area. Um, we also knew that um, because or, um, health workers themselves weren't going to, you know, mental health workers and health workers don't want to be seen on TV. We had to be really careful how we constructed the actions. They had to be relatively low key. Um, we didn't think we could mobilize large numbers of members. And because we didn't have contacts with a lot of community groups, we made our connections through our first roadshow. So we were going to have to build a list of people and relationships on an individual level and build trust with a large number of community groups that weren't used to doing campaigning. And of course, this is, you know, you know when I said earlier, you know, how did a pair of shoes make a change uh, and create a narrative when there had been years of advocacy. It's not that there wasn't a narrative there. It's just that the the narrative that existed wasn't there wasn't a political framing of what the problem was in a way that a campaign could really make a difference. And that's really what this campaign did. That was that did was different. So so once you've done your assessment and you've worked out what the the ground that you're you're on, you need to do the planning. And the planning is where we develop the strategy that implements that assessment of what's going on it's, and it's how we operationalize stuff. And our, our fundamental sort of theory of winning was if we tell personal stories that illustrate underfunding that people can relate to and we make it a health, uh, and we make health a key election, then the government at the time, which was national, which had been underfunding health for nine years, would either change its position on health funding or they'd lose the election to other parties because there's an issue they can't ignore that they have to have a position on and the and a public who care about the issue and know the party's positions will influence them through their vote. Uh, we, we, you know, in, in response to the concerns around all these different messages, what we decided was we wanted to turn a thousand different individual stories, siloed stories, into a thousand angles of one powerful underfunding message that could cut through the noise. And the way that we were going to do that was in a, in a basic framework, which was first to identify the problem with those strong personal issues, stories. So don't go and say to people, look, the problem's funding straight away. You know, show, don't tell. Show that there's a problem. Once we've done that, then we would aim to develop a community-owned solution that was authentic, that was coming from the right people and was being repeated by uh, journalists and commentators and other organizations because we we need because remember we said we needed other community groups to come on board and then the third step was to hold decision makers to account by forcing politicians to commit to health pledges around those community developed solutions so identify the problem develop community owned solutions and hold decision makers to account and the way that we did that was by lifting the lid on the stealth carts and um, and developing those those pledges, uh, which included transitioning that 1.7 billion back into the the health sector. The, so the other part of the strategy is obviously developing your narrative and the tactics. I won't go too much into the narrative because you can see that as we go through, and I've I've touched on it. The key tactics that uh, that that we needed to use was the messenger is the message. So we need to make sure we had a coalition to have an authentic voice. Because who is you know the mental health union? Who are we? Um, to, to speak on behalf of everyone. We needed to have, you know, community groups on board who people would see as the authentic messenger. Um, we needed to support others to tell their stories in the media. So whilst, you know, telling stories was a key tactic for us, uh, you know, most of the stories we told, you wouldn't actually see us in them at all. In fact, I would say 90% of the 300 plus stories we told, you would never have seen PSA or even the coalition in the story. The, as far as the, sorry, I'm jumping through things again. As far as the the narrative goes, um, we didn't want to attack national. We framed it that we were defending the public health system, and the, uh, you know, a Kiwis often get their backs up when you attack stuff, but when you defend stuff, people sort of get behind. And you've seen that in the past with union strikes and lockouts. When workers go on strike, people go, oh yeah, okay, they might have a point, but yeah, they're striking. Whereas if they're locked out. You know, the boss refuses to let them work. Everyone gets in behind. Same principle here. And remember that at the time, John Key was an incredibly popular prime minister and attacking him was getting people's backs up. But what we did want to do is we want to lift the lid to confirm the suspicions that many had about National's priorities. So, you know, show, don't tell. You know, um, 
we um, we didn't want to tell community facts. We want the human uh, those human stories that people can relate to to translate those issues into a campaign supported by facts. We didn't want to champion parties. We were championing issues and values from across the political spectrum because remember at the time, you know, National had a, a significant majority, and you know, when you're doing an election campaign, you need the party in power to also take on board your your positions. You're not just simply trying to get other parties in because if you don't, you need to shift shift it. And and because of that, we wanted to make sure that we were seen as independent. We, you know, we weren't inviting political parties to our events. If a political party brought some banners or flags for their party, we asked them to take it away. In fact, we did that with other organizations as well, because we wanted to be seen as championing those values, not those parties. Um, and uh, we didn't want the parties to dominate the narrative. And so what, so what we wanted to do with the narrative was to create this wave of support around these stories that when it crashed against the beehive, any political party could ride that wave. And we were going to make sure that everyone knew that. And so rather than telling people that we needed a change of government, which we clearly needed, we wanted to set it up that if National didn't pledge to demands from the community, National themselves would show that it's necessary for a change of government. And that's exactly what happened. As far as the actual tactics themselves go, um, I'll, I'll go into this in more detail later if we've got time, but essentially there's six key, key principles. Uh, the media does matter. I know a lot of us talk about social media, but media is still a really important thing. If we want to get stories, we have to be newsworthy. You know, it, it's not just knowing an injustice that's going to be enough. The TV is, is the main channel for communicating with large audiences. And that means we have to meet the news values they have to get our stories told. It, it's all good us having the perfect position, but if no one hears it, what's the point? tell a personal story, use striking images. In the case of our um, campaign, we wanted to repeatedly use the same images. So you can see in this image, this was our first roadshow. And a roadshow is basically where you take um, a story from the bottom of the country to Wellington and the top of the country to Wellington at the same time. And you repeat the same image over and over again with different personal stories and different towns to build momentum and, and, and sort of generate our own stories out of thin air, which is exactly what we did. And you saw in that video, the actions we do have to be not just compelling and motivating for the people who are participating, but they actually have to be realistic, something you can actually do. These cutouts, and this must have been an earlier version because I can already see some shitty bases which were really hard to use. You know, this wasn't as easy to put up as laying out shoes. And that meant that logistically it was a lot more difficult to do. Um, you know, uh, in fact, I think this was our trial one. We changed it afterwards because it was really hard to set them up in the time we needed to meet media um, timeframes with these, with these bases. The last thing is that uh, remember, I said we weren't guaranteed to mobilise members. Now, PSA is the largest union in New Zealand with 70,000 members, but, but we don't have a strong history of mobilising members for things like this. So the sixth principle is look strong even if you're weak. In this picture, you only need one person to make the story look powerful. You know, he's a, health, he's a mental health worker. There's clearly a broader political context that goes on. No one knows how many people were there to set that up. And I'll, I'll go into that a little bit more de uh, detail later. But you know, if, 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 the, if the story is about numbers, which many protests are, and the numbers are low, the media are not gonna wanna tell that story. Okay, here's, here's, the, here's how they were set up. Now this was actually, uh, we actually had quite a few people here, but um, you can see, you know, we had to line up all the bases and then we had to get these cutouts, which were made of core flute, which were really, really sharp. I don't know if you can see, but there were a lot of people wearing gloves because after the first two times we did it, we had so many cuts on our hands, we had to wear gloves. So this is all you know, practical logistical stuff that you need to do to set up your action. But if, if the image is powerful, but you can't set it up, then it's, it's, it's no good. Um, we would have preferred to have done like something that visualized need for patience. But remember, when we started as a union, we were focusing on our members and getting member stories. So we needed something that would connect with our members to, to motivate them to, to act. Then the, the next stage in the campaign is that we actually implement the plan of what we've done. So we've analyzed the situation, we've developed our plan, we, we, and then we need to act on our plan and monitor our work to ensure we stay on track. So most campaigns follow a really basic sort of um, a series of phases. A foundation is the period of when you prepare your campaign. So that's the, 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 um, the analysis and the planning. 
then then when you start you uh, um, you start your doing you start with a kickoff which is when you're first seen in the in the public eye and then you have a series of peaks which sort of increase your attention and media coverage and it does go up and down anyone who's done a campaign knows that you know you have a peak and then you have the peak which is the period where you have the most leverage to to influence the decision maker before you achieve your your uh, resolution so we're just gonna i'm just gonna go i'm just gonna go through those if i can Okay, so the foundation for this campaign was uh, we surveyed those 6,000 um, people working in health and we found that nine in 10 felt they didn't have the resources to give Kiwis the health care they need when they need it. That's 90% of people working in health. So right, an incredibly powerful sort of broad story. The survey also was our opportunity to collect the stories which we then used during the year. And we collected a lot of stories. Remember people working in health are people who use health services. So in that original video, most of the people you saw, even though uh, even the ones talking about their health stories were actually people working in health because union, union members are workers and workers are members of communities. Um, the, uh, one of the stories we got was there was a woman who did surgery on, on her back with a knitting needle because she couldn't get on a waiting list. We had a man who sold his house after nine years waiting on a waiting list who suddenly miraculously got offered the, the, um, the surgery he needed the day after he signed the deed of settlement on his house. You know, we were getting all sorts of really powerful stories that, that we could use to sort of, as a case study, um, to show that that night, you know, to give a personal angle to that nine and ten health workers feeling um, under resourced. Then, so the kickoff, we released that information, um, and we used a story about a, a PSA member who uh, was, uh, I think, it was in his thirties or forties, but he's quite young, and he had some bowel issues, and he asked to get, um, he wanted to go on the waiting list to get a bowel test, and they said, look, you're too young, so. Um, he, he just didn't get set. By the time he found out that he had bowel cancer, it was too, it was too late. You know, so you know, this was a really powerful story from someone who was willing to share their own pain, but also hope for change as a face uh, um, to uh, to start the ball ro rolling and get the campaign kicking off. Um, then the, um, the 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 peaks of the campaign was that roadshow that you saw before with the two hundred life. Uh, life-size cutouts and we were um, we got 40 prominent stories in local and national media and national stories we published um videos daily the video you saw earlier that's one that we made like i said it's a collage of different stories with a narration over it um and our roadshow track that video was seen more by more than fifty thousand people um another uh, oops sorry Another part of the, the peaks, we ran a community um, grassroots health funding conference. We supported community groups to keep telling their stories. We took every single opportunity that randomly came out of nowhere to get those cutouts out there. So, you know, there was a, um, the minister went to visit the hospital in Dunedin, which we knew was run down. So out came the cutouts. I think someone may or may not have chased him around the hospital with some cutouts. I can't confirm or deny. Um, and we also picked up some stories that were so powerful that we did little mini campaigns as a part of the broader campaign. And one of those was a story um, about a courageous lifesaver named Daniel, uh, um, Daniel um, McKay. A young woman rapidly losing her hearing is in a race against time to get treatment before she becomes totally deaf. She's been waiting years for an implant, but there's a long waiting list, prompting a call for the government to increase the number of operations it funds. Political reporter Andrea Vance has the story. Volunteer lifeguard Danielle Mackay has been saving lives for six years, but she's powerless to save her hearing. I love hearing all the basic things in life, like hearing the cows passing, the train tooting, um, people's voices, my family's voices, and um, even a toy singing in the morning. I don't want to lose those things, you know. She's been waiting three years for a cochlear implant, and in that time she's completely lost hearing in one ear. Tests say that in six months she'll be totally deaf. Every tick and count. Because once you lose that hearing, it's gone forever. It's gone. A recent letter from health officials was a blow. Hoping that this is my time, this is my year, really want the cochlear implant. 
The Ministry of Health says that there are 214 adults waiting for implants. It would cost up to $90,000 to have the operation privately. I feel like why am I not important? The government spends just over $8 million a year on cochlear implants. That pays for between 40 and 70 adults to have the surgery. The waiting is prioritised and the average length of time is 13 months. I'll have another look at the waiting list. Hearing impaired Green MP Mojo Mathers says there needs to be double the operations. They should just simply fund everyone who needs a cochlear implant. They need to clear the back look. Danielle Mackay just wants to focus on saving lives on her local beach. And I want to be able to heal in the water and not having to get my hair and I'd wet and tingling them away to get fit. Leaving her frustrated and... I'm really, really scared of losing my hair. So you can see that there's that Danielle's story sort of shapes a broader story around underfunding and you'll be happy to know as a result of the mini peak within our campaign we were able to get the national government to, to get her the implant that she needed as well as 60 other uh, other people so you know so whilst we had this broader campaign we were really responding to stuff that's coming up and where we saw an opportunity to to put extra time and energy and we were able to get little mini bumps along the way for our broader a broader campaign but what was happening was that the there was a bit of a drop in the campaign and the reason why we knew is because when you're acting a key part of doing is to monitor what your you know those key measurements that you've got to to, to determine if your campaign's been successful and we we it was really clear that our framing around health funding just wasn't kicking through as much as it really should be so what we did was we we sat down and and looked at the data, we did some polling, and we found that mental health and single crewing of ambulances were the standout issues that were having the most impact. And so we pivoted our campaign away from funding in general and focused solely on suicide prevention, funding for suicide prevention and mental health in general, which worked totally for the PSA, because as the, the New Zealand's mental health union, that was something that they obviously were pushing anyway. But what was interesting is that the poll that we did found that only 13% of the country thought that the national government was doing enough around mental health. And, and in that research, national party members were as angry as Labour Party members. So it was really clear that we had an opportunity to not just make mental health the key election issue, but it could actually be the issue that actually changed the election. So we, we worked with some of the brief whānau that we'd connected with through the original roadshow, because remember, we didn't have all these connections originally. And part of our analysis was that we knew we didn't. So we chose a tactic that would give us some credibility and relationship with people. And we sat down and we came up with a plan to focus in that area. Hundreds of pairs of shoes are being collected to represent the 579 New Zealanders who took their own lives last year. The shoes are being taken around the country as part of a roadshow that will reach Parliament next month. Alex Baird was with Grieving Families, who launched the campaign in Invercargill today. Four weeks ago, Dawn Hartley had no idea she'd be standing here. Lost in a sea of shoes, Dawn now cradles those once worn by her son. People say, what can we do for you? Bring Matt back. That's all I want is, is my Matt back. So, yeah, but it's not going to happen, so we just got to ca carry on. Nothing could prepare Dawn for the dreaded call that her son Matt had taken his own life. These are Matt's shoes, and Matt was six foot five, and these are his size 13 shoes. Along with dozens of others, Dawn is now telling her story as part of a campaign to raise awareness of suicide and get better government support. I know they're mats, but when I look at all these shoes behind us, it's really sad to think that all these people felt like they had to do what they did. The numbers behind these shoes are sobering. 70% of these were men, 8 were children aged between 10 and 14, and more than 50 were teens. But campaigners say that likely number is far higher. Jess Perdue joined Dawn in laying out the 579 pairs of shoes this afternoon. Everyone is someone who can make a difference and I'm here uh, basically to get the ball rolling. 
The 24-year-old says mental health is at crisis point in Invercargill and she'll be heading along with the roadshow to Parliament to make a stand for change. After I had lost my first friend to suicide, I searched for suicide support groups in Invercargill. Uh, Google came back to me, no results. These families are angry that so many people are still dying. I want to know why 579 shoes are sitting here. Um, the road toll isn't that, and that's a priority. Four people have killed themselves in Invercargill in the past four days, and the Yes We Care Coalition says this roadshow will be successful even if it stops just one more person dying. Alex Beard, News Hub. So you can, so you can see, you can see in the video, very similar structure to the cutouts, but we're using shoes, much more powerful symbol, uh, and the we've retained, you know, the, the the that the messenger is the message. You know, it's you didn't see me there, you didn't see the union organisers, you saw people directly affected by suicide. What Jess didn't say is that she's lost eleven people to to suicide. The the. So we took that across the country again. We had um, a number of videos. One of our videos got one and a half million um, views, which was the most uh, viewed political video of that year. Um, another video had 300,000 views, just someone walking up and down the shows. And Radio New Zealand had a story that was one of the most viewed ever on this, uh, this um, topic. It, w it went all around the world. It was really, really powerful. And so what we did was we readjusted our time frame so that the road show would become the peak. I remember I said before, the peak is where your greatest leverage is. So we took the, the um, road show to Parliament. And this is what happened. More than 600 pairs of shoes have been set up outside Parliament to mark World Suicide Prevention Day. The travelling collection marks each person who died from suicide in the country over the last year. Thomas Mead reports. The grim reality of suicide laid out on the steps of Parliament. 606 shoes representing the family and friends lost in a single year. What we need is help earlier on. Why we wait till these people are in crisis? The shoes travelling in two different collections have been displayed in 20 towns and cities, reaching their final destination today at the Beehive, calling for change. The Labour leader, with her own story of loss, promising to deliver it. Those shoes are quite moving to see. <clears throat> My best friend's brother, when I was just 13 years old, took his own life and he was only 15. Jane Stevens, who lost her son Nicky, has been on the trail. She's seen an outpouring of grief. We have been supported. Uh, by everybody that we've come in contact with and I didn't, I seriously didn't expect that. A cry for how placed on the doorstep of the nation's leaders. Thomas Mead. So, so we obviously went to, um, to Parliament. We had pledges which included a commitment to do a mental health inquiry. We wanted um, funding and support for bereaved um, families of suicide. Uh, and, and, a, and, and a small number of other things which we put to all parties, ACT and National didn't even respond. And so, but because of the way that it was framed, because this was written by mums that were bereaved, the, the, the feedback from the public was that, they, that those, that National and ACT's um, uh, terrible sort of managing of mental health was reflected in the refusal of these parties to even respond to bereaved families bringing what were pretty obvious claims which were framed in a non-political way and it, it framed National Act as being the ones that were were uh, being political and and whilst we remember that Jacinda Mania in, in uh, quotation marks uh, remember that their, the, the number of seats they had and the popularity of the parties is nowhere near what we had today the research that we did, uh, which was repeated by Labour and, and uh, re referenced by National, was that the, the, there was a direct correlation between a shift in votes for Labour and the number of mental health stories uh, in the region. So the, the last part of the campaign is, is around the review, and that's looking at what we've achieved and what we haven't achieved. We were able to get the largest funding in health in recent memory. We increased funding for cochlear implants, along with uh, the great work that was done by Action Station to get a mental health review. We successfully got that. Mental health and health were the top issues in most polls, and mental health was the top in all the key ones. 
the the um, obviously there was a change of government. Labor made that commitment around the funding, and PSA members felt confidence in their union because they saw us being more active in the media. But you know, we've also got to put things in context too. You know, this you know we weren't a, we our original plan was to make health the key issue, not just mental health. And when I last talked about this campaign, I spoke about um, Blair, and he was a father of two, that he had got told that he had to wait eight weeks for an urgent appointment with an oncologist before, uh, after being diagnosed with um, um, bowel cancer. And he, he, he was able to get, he was able to get the, the chemo to extend his life by three months so he could renew his wedding vows and spend time with his teenage daughters. But, you know, he, he wasn't just a, a victim of cancer. He was victim of an underfunded health system. Yes, there was a large uh, boost of funding to the health system, but it still didn't even close the gap of, of needing to historical funding. So there was a lot more work to do. But within the context of what the campaign was trying to do, within the resources we had, we were incredibly successful. The campaign just needed to continue to ensure that the inquiry into mental health implemented all the things that, that we needed. So, you know, when we started the campaign, oh, sorry, when we started the campaign, all we had was a pair of shoes. But to make those shoes become what they became, we needed to tell a series of powerful personal stories that everyday people could relate to. We needed those striking images of the shoes and we needed to repeat them with those personal stories so that we could uh, create and shift that narrative. And those actions needed not just be powerful, but they needed to be something that motivated people to turn up and set them up. And they needed to be done in a way that, could, that we could um, logistically achieve with the, uh, with the resources and volunteers that we had. And those images helped those stories become more newsworthy. It pushed those stories to the front page and it cut through the media noise. And we were able to shift the 20 year old narrative around a crisis that wasn't previously talking about political solutions. Uh, and we turned it into something that we could realistically win with the resources we had. And, and it required those personal stories, striking images wrapped around with a consciously planned political strategy. And it's one that's based on principles and actions and planning tips that are far easier to replicate than most people that, that realize. And, you know, it often seems that w because we've got no resources that we can't make that change and we feel pa um, powerless. But with creativity, strategy and a hope for change, we can turn a simple pair of shoes into real change that matters. And instead of seeing our meager resources as being limiting of what's possible, we can actually shift the context and make the impossible seem possible. And so, you know, we, you know, a simple pair of shoes, some hope, some incredibly powerful stories from Barif um, Fano was able to achieve something which a year before just seemed completely impossible. So here's a good quote from a media perspective. Oh, well, that's actually a good picture too, but I didn't mean to use that, <laughs> use that one. But um, so that's, that's sort of a, a, a you know, a, case study that reinforces some some key basic things. So I'm just gonna open up to questions and um, Abby's going to facilitate who who comes through. Um, feel free to type it into the chat too and Abby will pull those things out. If you would prefer to dig a little bit deeper into the practicalities of how to do those tactics, um, I can do that too, but um, we've got to finish in uh, 10 minutes. So um, let, let us know. Over to you, Abby. Great, thank you, Simon. That was amazing. Um, such a, it was an incredibly powerful campaign. There's no question. Um, so if anybody has any questions, by all means, feel free to drop them in the chat and I can read them out for you. Oh, or because it's not a massive group if people want to just unmute and ask their question verbally, then you're also more than welcome to do that. Anybody have any questions for Simon? Haven't had any pop through the chat yet. <laughs> 